100 miles in seven days. <laughs> I'm worried about my legs and other parts of my body. <laughs> Pray for good weather and no wind and um, soft seats on the bike and um, just hope everybody does well and we it, there'll be some bumps in the road we already had a flat tire and we haven't even started um you know i was talking to so many cyclists they said day two is going to be the tough day uh i i yeah well, i think they'll all be tough but we'll see <laughs> it'll be fun it's good for them it's it's good for everybody well, you know, it's uh, paying it forward. You know, we got a lot of support from Cincinnati Children's. We got a lot of support from people in Cincinnati, uh, as well as from people from New York, from pretty much all over the world. And uh, it's a way to pay it forward for those that follow. And it's always also paying respect to what my daughter has been through and, um, and to all the HLH kids out there, you know. idea what these children go through and these what these families go through and um, I'm, I'm excited that that Justin's getting getting the information out there I'm ready to get riding I spent so much time planning this over the last three or four months it's taken quite a bit of work putting this whole thing together so I'm happy that it's finally here and it's time to time to really do the easy part and just paddle for the kids. My name's Justin Aiken and currently in the middle of a 700 mile bike ride over seven days going from Natchez, Mississippi to the front door of Cincinnati Children's Hospital where my two-year-old son Andrew and my five-year-old son Matthew both passed away from a horrible immune disorder called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis also known as HLH. This is my third year of riding a bicycle a long distance for my sons, and this year five other riders have, have come out to, uh, to join me on this journey. This is a story of hope, loss, love, determination, and new friendships. One of the most difficult things in life is to watch someone you love suffer. When that loved one is a child, the pain is immeasurable. This is the story of families who have suffered greatly. Some have had to endure the loss of their children. Some have children who have survived. One is a survivor himself. They come together on a journey of extreme determination, a little stronger and inspired. HLH is um, it's a bit of a mystery, but in uh, basic terms, as we understand, it's uh, regulation of the immune system gone awry. Move your hand. Thank you. We have built-in controls of the immune system so that after it takes care of an infection, it has to turn itself down so that it does not cause collateral damage to our own organs and tissues. And if left untreated, this uh, uncontrolled inflammatory attack on our organs can severely damage them, including proving fatal. Mirabel um, is now uh, three and a half years old. She's two years post-transplant. She was diagnosed uh, regretfully with HLH at the age of, uh, actually the day before her first birthday. My daughter had a very aggressive form of HLH. Uh, she had the genetic form, FLH. It uh, was in the central nervous system. She was 50% paralyzed. Just before she was diagnosed and the doctors saw that she was not moving anymore, they said, you have three options. You have uh, option one, which is cancer, 
option two, which is a blood disease, or option three, which is HLH. And we still in denial said, oh, well, what should we pray for? Thinking like, oh, you know, it's obviously not gonna be one of the three. Um, he said, well, you should pray for cancer. Cancer has a bigger chance of survival uh, in the 90s for children. And we said, so what should we avoid at all costs? He said, HLH. The Natchez Bicycling Club is meeting us to, to send them off. We have some friends and some kids here to cheer them on. We're, we're super excited. Everybody has something they go through. This guy's been through a lot. Just to show them some support and show them that Natchez cares. Because we do. Crazy friend. It's yeah. called Justin. <laughs> what don't you do for friends, right? <laughs> and for kids. How do you think for kids? It's good. It's good though. I recommend it. They're these guys that are riding every day need they don't they don't need anything. They don't need anything. But but you want to be there to give them something. How do you feel? You know what? I feel really good. Do you? I do. Um, I started thinking about all the kids in the hospital right now fighting HLH, getting chemo and getting steroids, and they should be at home riding their bicycles. And that's why I'm out here doing this. I'm riding my bicycle for them since they can't. Um, well, Olivier and uh Doug stopped just to have a little break and discuss on the on the lighting, but uh, they a couple cars stopped just to see if everything was fine, and we waved them on. But uh, one lady actually pulled off. I guess she saw the signs on the vans, and she said, "Are you guys still taking donations?" And we're like, "Yeah, definitely." And she tossed. She just handed me a bill, and so I walked over the RV and then I opened it up, and it was a hundred bucks. And so there you go. So, no, it was, it was great. It was horrible. Yes, sir. I was like, Doug, leave me. Like roadkill, just leave me, go, go. Because I have no men behind, Ollie. He just grabbed me on his shoulder on one side of the bike, and the other he got us on his bike, and he just went. It's like, thank you, Doug. <laughs> Yesterday, there's another rider, Doug Myers, who has taken Sean under his wing. Um, wherever Sean goes, he, he makes friends, and Doug has really hooked up with him. And they, they made a wrong turn, we made a wrong turn. Bottom line is we lost them. Um, and uh, in that 10, 15, 20 minutes, I, I was panicked. Um, and we'd been panicked before. And we kept saying to each other, Sean's got a good head on his shoulders. He's a smart kid. He's, he's an inspiration. He'll tough it through. And sure enough, you know, 10 miles up the road, there they were <laughs> just biking along. Um, but it was a flashback. It was, oh my God, I'm out of control. I don't know where he is. I can't help him. People who have um, suffered with HLH or had a family member with HLH, your life is different. Um, you appreciate simple things. Um, big things don't matter anymore. Um, it doesn't. It's just it's what we've gotten out of this experience. For me, it's just, you know, just doing it for Amy. Just, uh, you know, I just wanted to know that <clears throat> I'm doing all the mileage and doing it for her and stuff. And I just, that's what I'm spending the rest of my life doing is just keeping her alive, keeping her spirit alive. And, and I want to keep all these little ones that are fighting with it. I just, you know, I just want to, I want to make a difference for, for everybody, hopefully in some small way. wide open plains the wind just comes whipping in on the side and there's a lot more hills today. <laughs> it becomes a mental game at this point in time. Boredom sets in and you're just ready to get off the bike. You know, you find that you start looking at your speedometer, odometer a lot more often and um, Saying, your, tell, saying to yourself, I can't believe it hasn't changed more, basically. But, uh, but still, you know, it's wonderful just to be out here. As adults, we don't go ride bicycles very often anymore. And we don't get out 
with mother, mother nature like we should and and that's allowing us to do this and uh, really appreciate you know life itself all right oh no that's fine keep going guys keep going I'm Ann Flaherty. Um, my son William was diagnosed with HLH at age three, and we we weren't quite grasping it. So one day we sat down, had a meeting with the doctors, and we said, "Okay, on a scale of one to ten, with one is healthy and ten is dead, where is our child?" And they said, "You're at 9.5," and the room went silent. We have had people who were diagnosed in their teens, some diagnosed even in adulthood, but majority of them will present themselves early on in childhood. The most severe cases will present in infancy. Uh, there are so many other uh, infections such as viruses that can appear to be HLH that making the diagnosis can become tricky and that is what uh, has led to misdiagnoses or late diagnoses of this disease for such a long time. Today we know the genetic cause of, I would say, 85 to 90 percent of all cases of primary HLH, and that has allowed us to make better diagnoses and provide uh, better care to the children who suffer from it. So what we need to remind pediatricians is that in addition to infections, they need to keep HLH on their radar uh, just as high as infections. And we need to rewrite some of the old textbooks uh, that say that immune deficiencies are extremely rare. We don't know how rare these disorders are, especially a disorder like HLH. It may be more common than many of us even now believe just because it can manifest itself in different forms. Because it's such a dangerous disease that you require a bone marrow transplant in order to uh, essentially stop it. So just like children that are born with essentially no immune system, right, in order to survive, they need a bone marrow transplant. Well, hey, can I feel your tummy? while your mama's waiting on, the, on hold. Yeah. Can we hop over here? In the case of HLH, you have an immune system that doesn't know when to quit, uh, and for that reason, you also need a bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, bone marrow transplant itself is a very tricky treatment. If you have a matched sibling uh, donor, the chances of a successful bone marrow transplant are pretty high, approaching 80 to 90 percent. On the other hand, if it is um, if the transplant has to be performed using an unrelated donor, then the risk of complications becomes pretty high, where the success rate would be only about 50 to 60 percent. So close to half the children will not survive their treatment. Many of these children will end up spending months, if not sometime, in some cases years, in the hospital, only to eventually then succumb to the complications of the bone marrow transplant. The treatment itself is the is the second uh, the second insult on top of an underlying fatal disease it's just a matter of time before it strikes and when it does it could be too late and when we checked the worldwide bone marrow registry there was only one match in the world for matthew and so if down the road matthew got sick and something had happened to that person and they were no longer available we would have had nothing for matthew so my wife and i as parents had to make the extremely difficult decision to take Matthew into a transplant prophylactically and in, in an effort to, to save his life. And, and ultimately, it took its, his life. Yeah, I think the divorce rate for parents who lose a child, I've heard, is around 98%. And I'm sure there is no number for parents who lose two children, you know. And, and a lot of people ask me, how are you still married? And I tell them, how can I not be? I saw the amazing job that, that Kristen did in taking care of these two wonderful sons of ours. And so I love her that much more because of what a great mother she, she is and was to them. Danny, um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I love you, and uh, I'm sorry that uh, I tried to do all I can. I'm sorry that uh, maybe I fell short, but uh, anyway, I love you. I'm going to spend every day loving you and, and keeping you alive in this world uh, in spirit, and thank you for uh, 
thank you for the five amazing years that you gave us because they were the most amazing years I could ever imagine. So I love you, baby girl. Uh, after seeing so many children suffer um, and go through so much in the hospital and still not make it, this is, this is uh, not just a job for me. I, this has become very personal now. You're a parent, you're supposed to protect your child, and there was nothing we could do to protect him. Um, when he had the seizures, I unfortunately was in the room when I saw it, and uh, they called Code Blue. Um, they rushed him down to ICU um, and didn't know whether he'd make the day. Um, and we, we pulled our family together. We were praying, we were hoping that this would turn out well. We went across the street to the adult hospital where um, that doctor there pretty much said, I'm not going to touch you, you have a pediatric disease, I've never done these before, that kind of stuff. And he was the, the bone marrow doctor because he does it all the time for cancer patients. So we were kind of left, left just hanging there. Long story short, we were airlifted October 29th down to Cincinnati Children's Hospital where we met our saint, Dr. Jordan, and all the staff at Cincinnati Children's. He's shown resilience, he's shown uh, that life can continue on no matter you know how you are. Uh, you know you, you you have can't do as much, but that's his, that's what life has given him, and he's taken that attitude and uh, tried to spread the word of, about HLH, visiting his donor in uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, her name is Jenny, and uh, we got to meet her three years ago. How was that? Incredible. Strangers become family in an instance. A young man from Canada meets a young mother from Citrus Heights for the first time. What do you say, right? But uh, I don't know, thank her. That's pretty much all you can do. How did, how did she react too? Uh, it was, well, it was her that, it was the, the reaction. Crying and all that good stuff. And But uh, no, it was, it was really cool. And then we hung out with her for a week and yeah, it was good. There were days I, I doubted, and I'm, a, I'm an optimist, and I believe that the op optimist conquers all. But there were days I was sitting next to her crib, and, and I was thinking, this is not, I'm not gonna see her get married. And uh, although now that she's healthy, I hope she stays with me for life and she never gets married. <laughs> Good job, young girl. Three four months after Matthew passed away, and it was the one year anniversary of Andrew's death that um, it was Labor Day weekend, and my wife and I on that Friday night got an email from a friend of ours who's an OB in St. Louis. And this email said, a 15 year old girl walked into my practice today, and she's eight and a half months pregnant, and she's hid the entire pregnancy from her mom, but she's decided that she wants to give her baby up for adoption. And I told her your story, and she wants to talk to you. And so the next day, my wife reached out to this 15-year-old girl's mom, and they started communicating over the next couple of days. And ultimately, it was the following Thursday when we got a phone call at 9 o'clock that night. Um, and this 15-year-old girl's mom said, OK, my daughter and her boyfriend have chosen you to be the parents of their child. And oh, by the way, she's in labor right now. Uh, what? <laughs> and. She called again the next morning and said, a baby boy was born. Do you want to come up to the hospital and meet everybody? We went back to that hospital and took William Clayton Aiken home with us. And um, then my wife and I kept asking, where did you come from? <laughs> How did we get you? Uh, and then for months on end, we would hear him just laughing and talking in the middle of the night. And my wife and I couldn't help but think, there's two little boys in heaven that helped bring him to us because we don't know where he'd be. we would be without him. You know, we knew that we needed something to put our love into. Olivier was to be honored for his work with the Ecola da Silva Foundation, but the gala was in New York City and was happening on the fifth night of the ride. They were in the middle of Kentucky. 
Dennis and Ann generously made it possible for the whole team to fly to New York City and celebrate with their new friend. Kind of like a wise guy. Is that Frankie? I'm a friend of Justin Aiken of the Aiken Foundation uh, convinced me to cycle 700 miles with uh, my table there. And let me tell you, we've done 500 miles. It hurts. An incredibly memorable evening to an already extraordinary week. Okay, if, if he's got HLH, then what's the plan? They gave us two scenarios, two plans. And um, they said, really, you're in the right spot for this disease. Like, we're, the, we're actually the experts on this disease. So we went on the internet and looked it up. And the, the three places in the world with experts on HLH are in Japan, Sweden, and Cincinnati, Ohio. And the highest they were concentration, right. <laughs> yeah, and the highest concentration of HLH experts is in Cincinnati, Ohio. But no one knows it. And that's that's the problem. That's right? the problem. We're probably, as my sister would say, the luckiest unlucky people in the world. And um, that's all good because we happen upon it. So how do we sit there and not have it where it's just blind luck? How do we help others? Our son is healthy, and we now have means. So we sat there and are trying to lessen the luck aspect of it for other families. I am ready. Um, See your wife? Yes. Looking forward to, to seeing my wife and, you know, and looking forward to seeing all these hospital employees that became our family. There's families of survivors and that will be at the finish line today and there are some families of some of the children that we um, talked about and dedicated that days to this week that are coming in for this HLH conference that we've never even met these moms and dads but they'll be there at the finish line to see us in which is really really neat so looking forward to meeting them for the very first time. Looking forward to uh, seeing something that I recognize. That'll be a good feeling. I think they're crazy, <laughs> but they're also my heroes. Andrew Aiken Foundation would like to present a check for $100,000 to the HLH Center of Excellence. So proud of you! Bring it on, William. Hopefully the next couple are able to find Cincinnati Children's, you know, on the first go-around, not the second or third bone marrow transplant. Yeah. That's what this is about. This is about trying to save one more child, give them the best shot possible. We have this common bond in that we all understand and know uh, what it's like to live in that hospital with our children. You know, it's no different than going to war. And, um, you know, and after that war, you're close to the people that you went to war with. And um, so this week's been an amazing journey we've had a lot of fun, 
out there. Um, a lot of laughs. And uh, yeah, there were some there were some injuries, and there's been some pretty big hills. But it's you know what, the hills are, are no different than the battle with HLH. You just stare in front of your front tire, and you just pedal. And before you know it, you're at the top of that hill. Strong again, I've wanted to be 